All right, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, depending on when you are joining or watching us. Um, I'm Heather Roscoe. I'm the clinical manager with Montana Family Planning. If you're not familiar with who I am, and today um, we appreciate you joining our quarterly clinical conference call on syphilis and syphilis serology. We have a guest speaker with us today, Tammy Bennett, who I will introduce a little later. Um, just some housekeeping items I want to review before we start. So this is a two-hour webinar that we've planned, and we do have a, about a five-minute break about halfway through, so you'll we'll get a chance to get up, move around, um, and do whatever you might need to do at that time. But um, we'd love to have you turn on your cameras if you're willing and able to or have one so that we can see you during this presentation. That would be super fantastic. Um, and we'll also do our best to keep you engaged during the presentation by asking any questions, um, utilizing the chat, and there'll be some poll questions that you'll see as well. And then if you're attending this later, feel free to maybe have a notepad or jot these things down or just think um, through them, these questions that we have as you move your way through the presentation. Um, feel free to type any questions that you might have into the chat and we will do our best to address them during the presentation, but know that we will also have a Q&A session planned as we wrap up. So uh, before we get started, we must acknowledge, um, oh, Tammy, can you go back one of the acknowledgements? There we go, perfect. So our, our acknowledgements for this training is it's supported by funding from the Office of Population Affairs through the Department of Health and Human Services, which funds our program, as well as the Clinical Training Center for Sexual and Reproductive Health, who is supporting this training. The opinions expressed and the view are the views of the contributors and do not necessarily um, reflect the official position of HHS, OPA, or the Clinical Training Center for Sexual and Reproductive Health. Next slide. And then the nursing disclosures. So this nursing continuing professional development activity was approved by Montana Nurses Association, an accredited approver with distinction by the American Nurses Credentialing Center's Commission on Accreditation. The total nursing contact hours are two, and in order to receive your nursing contact hours, you must attend the entire activity and submit the evaluation form at the end identifying one intended practice change related to the management of syphilis. Nursing contact hours are available until September 28, 2025 for this event. And then none of the planners or presenters for this educational activity have relevant financial relationships to disclose with ineligible companies. Great, so it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today. Tammy Bennett has been began her work as a women's health nurse practitioner career 23 years ago. She's been working as the Title X regional nurse, overseeing 11 clinics performing Title X services, and as an APRN delivering Title X services for the last seven years, being the Louisiana Reproductive Health statewide nurse consultant, overseeing all Title X services in Louisiana. She currently works with over 60 parish health units and six subrecipient clinics to provide quality family planning services. One of Tammy's passions is ensuring all persons have equitable access to quality FDA approved methods of contraception and offering these methods using a client-centered approach. Another passion includes educating providers and clients on sexually transmitted infections, screening, appropriate treatment, and risk reduction strategies. Both passions have merged into Congruent Consultants Corporation, where she assists other organizations in incorporating sexual and reproductive health care into their practice. And Tammy wanted me to share her motto with you. And together we can provide quality sexual and reproductive health services, making a difference one client at a time. I love that. So before I turn it over to Pam, uh, Tammy, I'd like to review some surveillance data with you all. And you all, all might be familiar with this information um, that's coming, but I think it's important just as a quick refresher. Next slide, great. So in 2012, two states, the District of Columbia and one U.S. territory had a rate of reported primary and secondary syphilis greater than or equal to 7.6 cases per 1,000 population. 
As you can see, this increased to 42 states, DC and one territory in 2021. So this slide just goes to show that we're not alone in Montana seeing these increasing rates. Next slide. Montana surveillance data sp spans back to 1919 and has seen similar trends in increasing cases. I think it's in interesting to see that the number of cases in 2022 were similar to the number of cases back in 1948. Um, in 1928, this person discovered penicillin and from 1943, it became the main treatment of syphilis. I'd love for you to type in the chat, do you know who this person was who discovered penicillin? I'll give folks just a minute to think about it. Okay, I'll help you out. It was Al Alexander Fleming. Next slide. There we go. So the number of syphilis cases um, by all stages in Montana. So this is um, as of June 8th, 2023. Montana Department of Public Health and Human Services reported a total of 332 syphilis cases at all stages. Again, this graph just shows where cases are highest, and you'll note that some of these areas are also near or on reservations. So in 2021, the highest rates of reported primary and secondary syphilis cases were among American Indian and Alaska Native persons, about 47%. During 2020 to 2021, the greatest increase in rate of reported primary and secondary syphilis cases were among American Indian Alaska Native persons from about 27% to 47%, or about a 74% increase. American Indian Alaska Native persons also had the greatest five-year increase in rate of reported primary and secondary syphilis, so from about 11% to about 47% which was about a 325% increase from 2017. So I think this slide is important when you think about health disparities and the population served. Um, and while we consider equitable access to sexual and reproductive health care services important, as well as addressing trauma in historically underserved populations, these topic areas deserve their own discussion, one, we, we, one which we won't be covering today. Next, we'll look at congenital syphilis. So in 2012, seven states had a rate of reported congenital syphilis greater than or equal to 16 cases per 1,000 live births. This increased to 41 states, D.C. and two U.S. territories in 2021. Again, we're not alone here in Montana of seeing increasing rates of congenital syphilis. And then in Montana specifically, you can see the number of cases have increased with one reported case in 2019 and 11 cases reported so far this year. And this data is current as of just two, two weeks ago. Again, in looking at health disparities among race and ethnicity for congenital syphilis in 2021, the rate, the highest rate of reported cases of congenital syphilis per 1,000 live births was among mothers who were American Indian or Alaska Native, who also experienced the greatest increase in rate of reported cases of congenital syphilis, syphilis during 2020 to 2021, as well as the greatest five-year increase in rate of congenital syphilis. So you can see this very, very similar trend in the data presented earlier in the rates of primary and secondary syphilis. I think it's also important to note that there were also no decreases in the rate of congenital syphilis among any race or ethnicity group from 2017 to 2021. So with that, I would like to turn it over to, to Tammy to um, start our the rest of the presentation. Thanks, Tammy. Thank you, Heather. Hello, everyone. I'm coming to you live from near the New Orleans, Louisiana area. Um, I promise I will not throw any beads at you, um, but we're hopefully going to have a very interactive um, share time. And I hope that at the very end of this, you will not be afraid of syphilis. You will be ready to test everybody and then learn to interpret those results. That is my goal. Um, 
at, at, with any of my talks, I really love questions. So you please feel free to put them in the question and answer, because if you have that question, I can promise you probably someone else does too. Um, so with that, what is syphilis? Well, um, there's a quote by Sir William Osler that says, he who knows syphilis knows medicine. And I think that all of us will agree, no one will ever know everything about medicine. And so syphilis is one of those things. It's also called the great imitator. And um, it can look and mimic other things so easily. And as we go through the presentation, I'm going to show you some pictures. And hopefully you can put it in the chat what um, some of these may um, resemble. Like if you were to see them coming through the ER or dermatology clinic or even your Title X site. Um, so again, it's called the great imitator. It can mimic rectal cancer, penile cancers, ulcerations, um, and also there's going to be some um, some things where it looks like psoriasis or, you know, um, even just a contact dermatitis if they have the rash. So uh, as we go through, you're going to see it does have some similarities. Um, so here's our first poll, and I will, again, want this to be interactive and fun, but let's see how comfortable are you with uh, syphilis labs, staging, treatment, and follow-up, and then um, we're going to discuss why is accurate staging so important. So you should be able to answer this. Okay, so we've got... Some comfortable, some neutral, and some uncomfortable. So that's great. We let's let's dig in and let's see where we are at the very end. Um, all right. So let's talk about why is accurately staging syphilis so important. Does anybody have an idea? Anybody want to come off mute or put it in the chat? Um, for accurate treatment, and then also um, to make sure you're doing partner follow-up correctly too. Absolutely, yes. If it's not staged and treated appropriately, then the treatment is not going to fall where it needs to go. So yes, absolutely. Um, so let's learn about, um, about the stages of syphilis. It starts with an infection an event that leads the bacteria to in, uh, come through the mucous membranes and infect the um, other partner. This can lay dormant for about three weeks to three months. And at the, it, at the first stage that you really have symptoms is called the primary stage where you get a primary ulcer. And then if you're not treated, that ulcer is gonna heal on its own. And then you go into secondary, and then if, if you're not treated, it's going to go away on its own. And then you go into a latency phase where during latency, there's no signs and symptoms. And the only way that you're going to know that, you, that a person has syphilis is by testing that person. And you can go into, you know, the categories of, um, well, we're going to talk about each one of those, unknown, early, and late, and then tertiary. So let's dig into all of these, and I do have some pictures, but I know y'all are in the medical field, and you can handle it over lunch. Here we go with primary syphilis. It starts with a single or multiple shankers, but most of the time it's a single shanker. The only time I have ever seen multiple shankers is when like the labia fold in on each other and you can have what's called kissing shankers. Um, and you can have this around um, the penis, the vagina, the anal area, rectum. You can have it inside the um, the mouth or on the lip. You can also, I have seen it on the cervix. So because these are usually painless ulcerations, then um, sometimes they can go unnoticed. Um, usually you only, you know, you only search for something if, if it's obviously visible, but it's not going to be visible usually if it's around the anal opening or um, um, near the cervix. The reason why it is not painful is because the bacteria Treponema pallidum um, puts out a numbing effect on the tissues. So um, when it's when that's kind of like a uh, 
I guess, a good side effect to having a, a, a big ulcer. But on the other side, if you don't know if it's not hurting you, you may go ahead and miss it too. It is usually firm, round, and painless. And again, it has, this is what it looks like typically, you have a rolled edge and a clean base. So it doesn't have a lot of purulent activity going on. This is what I was called uh, calling earlier the kissing shankers. It probably started in one area and then because the labia folds in together, you can get one on the other side. Um, we're going to skip this one for a moment. Um, again, this is just a classic, classic look of, of a primary shanker here. Now this, if you were to see this come into your clinic, what would you think that was? And then his history is, this just started about two weeks ago. You would wonder uh, what kind of timeline two weeks is on, right? Because this looks like it's got to be, have got to have been brewing for longer than two weeks. And I would think we're talking about some kind of penile cancer. What this is, is this is a syphilis primary shanker in a person living with HIV that is uh, not in treatment. So you can see where um, it has a much more invasive um, sometimes presentation whenever um, the person is immunocompromised in, in any of the, their immunocompromised states. And you can also see where that can mimic, you know, other things. Um, if it's not, if it goes untreated, then the primary uh, shanker heals up on its own. And they just go along for one to three months and think everything's fine. And then all of a sudden they start breaking out into this rash. 90% of all people get the rash. It's a macula papular pustular lesions, but it also, if you ever see a rash that involves the uh, palms of the hands and the soles of the feet, let that be the blue light warning that something bigger is going on, that this is not a reaction to their detergent or their new soap. This is something bigger. Um, Condyloma lata, we're going to go through all of these and I'll explain as they go through, but condyloma lata is not the same as genital warts. Condyloma lata looks like warts, but they always have a pinkish color and they're wet and they're very fast growing. I'll give you an example when we get there and tell you a story so you can remember that. Mucous membrane patches, that's kind of where you get those um, canker sores, you know, in your mouth, or you can get some mucus patches. Um, because the, uh, the treponema pallidum bacteria is now more widely disseminated in the bloodstream, you're going to have more constitutional symptoms like the fever, tiredness, the sore throat, weight loss. It can also mimic like early HIV infection because you've got those constitutional symptoms. And then it can invade the central nervous system at any time during this the syphilis journey. It doesn't have to be in secondary. It's not always in tertiary. It can happen at any time. So with, with the central nervous system, of course, if it invades that, that's a whole nother treatment algorithm um, that requires IV penicillin. And if you don't act on it quickly, you you know, if it does, affect the eyes or the ears, they can uh, lose their sight or their hearing. So we do want to make sure we're uh, screening for, um, for neurosyphilis. Okay, here's some pictures. Again, anytime you have a rash on the um, palms of the hands and the soles of the feet, then that let that be a, a big warning that something more is going on. This is just a disseminated rash. It's uh, not itchy, but gosh, it looks like it's just miserable, but, you know, they just notice it. And they, a lot of times what we find in Louisiana, you know, we've been battling syphilis for quite a while down here in Louisiana. And so they'll go to the dermatologist and they'll get a shot of Celestone and some cream and miraculously in a week or so it goes away. Guess what? That wasn't the Celestone that was, that was, that was fixing it. It just naturally wears its course and goes away. So they still have syphilis and it's still active. Um, that's what we have 
been trying to get the word out to all of our providers here about is looking at those hands and feet. Now, I don't want to say that it's mandatory to have that rash on the hands and the feet. I have seen a syphilitic rash just in the small of the back. I have just seen it on the lower trunk. So just when you think you know it all, another one will come in and just blow blow the blow the water to you. So this is typical presentation, but there's always those outliers. This is what the rash looks like on um, persons of color. It can really um, sometimes look like some uh, psoriasis going on. Um, so don't let it fool you. If someone came in with this on their face, what would you think? Somebody unmute and just tell me, tell me what this looks like. Ringworm. What do y'all think? Yeah. This is actually what the beginning stages of what it will turn into be like this, which is called nickel and dime lesions. And actually, as soon as you give the penicillin, probably within a week or two, this is going to be completely resolved. So penicillin, Mr. Alexander is a, is a hero. This is what we call um, condyloma lata. So um, the difference between, you know, see how they, they're elevated lesions, they can look like um, genital warts, but the difference is, is that no matter what the skin color is, these are going to retain their pinkish, fleshy colored uh, appearance. They're also more wet and moist. Uh, you can see the reflection of just kind of the moisture here. Um, than uh, typical genital warts. So think of pink and wet. And then what you'll find is in the history, they're going to tell you that this has popped up on them in the last couple of weeks. And you're like, oh, that kind of just happened in a couple of weeks. But you know what? It really does. And then as soon as you give that bicillin, it's usually gone in a couple of weeks. So very, very rapid. Um, if you were to scrape um, some sections of like, like this off and look under a dark field microscope, you would actually be able to see the coiled helical um, bacteria. Um, some other symptoms within secondary, because we were talking about it um, doing the dissemination throughout the whole body, you're going to get like the patchy alopecia, you're going to get lymphadenopathy, um, some of the time. Now, not all the time, but some of the time, and I have I have actually seen this as well. All right. So we go through secondary. No treatment. They think, oh, that, that, the less stone works, didn't it? <laughs> well, it really didn't. Um, then they go into a latency phase where they can still um, possibly transmit this infection to someone else, but there's no active signs of it. So, um, the only way to know is to actually test someone. Now there's three possible stages. There's early latent, and that's the, the time that they're still considered infectious. But then there's late latent, and then there's unknown. So we're gonna go through each one of these um, individually. What you're gonna see me do is this thing with my hands. Do y'all see this? It kind of looks like a football goal. Okay, and uh, it's not a football goal. I am not a football fan. What this means is it is a time frame. It is a window of one year. Everything hinges on this 12 months, 365 days to determine if they're early or if they're in the late stage. So let's talk about that early time frame. If you see an infection and the symptoms have occurred within that last 12 months, then you can say they're early. If you have no symptoms at all right now, and you can pull like the last serology test, and it was, they had a documented negative within that last 12 months, then you know they're early. Um, we're going to talk more about rising titers, but if they've ever had syphilis in the past, um, and you have the titer within a year and then you see a fourfold increase within that year, you know they're early. And then if they've been a contact of syphilis or had their uh, uh, age at first sex was within a year, then you can go with that. Um, 
and just use the treatment for early latent. Now, late latent is where when we pull the labs, it was over a year ago when they were negative. And so we cannot guarantee that they actually got this infection within the last year. Um, you can also um, do uh, uh, late latent whenever they have no past serology report, like you ask your, your friends in the health department to pull the data and um, there's nothing to go on. So we're going to go ahead and err on the safe side and do late latent with the series of three injections. All right. The, um, the, the one that has the no past serology results, it really falls into syphilis of unknown duration because if we don't have any labs, it could have been within the last year. It could have been more than a uh, a year ago, but we're, like I said, going to err on the safe side of going ahead and treating um, with the three. Um, the uh, syphilis of unknown duration and late latent are both reported the same in the, uh, is that Midas? Midas? Which one? Yep, Midas. <laughs> Midas. Okay, good. Um, ours in Louisiana is actually called PRISM. So Midas is is yours that you use, but it's a it's a database that holds all of the the information. So um, then the reason why they're reported the same is because it's the same um, same treatment and uh, follow up for partners as well. Okay, and I know the typo there, folks. It's just M I D I S. Um, the yeah. one that you're familiar with is Midas. <laughs> ah, I keep going with A S, didn't I? <laughs> I think that might be a tire. I'm not sure. But anyway, <laughs> um, tertiary syphilis is a very slow progressive disease. So let's say that, you know, latency can last for years to 50 to all the way to 50 years. And some people will develop tertiary syphilis and some will never develop it. We really don't know which ones it's going to be. Um, tertiary syphilis is not necessarily happens after X amount of years either. And some people, if they're going to get it, they might be able to start um, with these um, progressive um, uh, disease um, issues, which we're going to go through here in a minute, um, in two years, whereas others, it might take them, you know, 30 or 40 to, to get to. Um, what what you can get is, of course, with the neurosyphilis, with the um, optic neuritis and uveitis, um, and then when you do a spinal tap, whenever you send the, the fluid off to the lab, you will see a positive um, VDRL or RPR in that, in that titer. For tertiary, you can also get aortic um, regurgitation or aortic aneurysm because this bacteria is affecting all of your internal organs. There's gummatous lesions where um, the, uh, remember the, the penile ulceration that was so invasive, that could actually be called a gummatous lesion as well. And um, it may mimic a tumor on the penile shaft. The, you can also get these large rectal masses that look like rectal cancer, but in reality, it's, it's the gummatous um, lesions. Now, this next picture, um, I can warn you that if we saw this um, person walking around in the United States, we would probably take her by the hand to the nearest uh, medical facility. Um, but in third world countries, they do not have the penicillin availability that we do. And we've got to remember that um, even in the first part of the um, 20th century, we didn't have penicillin. So um, historically, what would happen is um, the person would get syphilis. There was really no treatment. Eventually, um, the bacteria would eat the flesh of the, um, the, the nose and they would um, build wax and make a fake nose. So a story um, down here from the South is um, women would make their fake noses and then they would sit in front of the fire and of course their nose would start to melt. So there's these things that um, come out from the fireplace and it's called a face shield. For the very first time I saw that last year whenever we went on a trip to uh, Na um, Natchez, Mississippi and in one of those old antebellum homes they had 
the face shield. So I had to educate the the tour guide on what that was really for. It was so their nose wouldn't melt off. Um. Anyway, so uh, once it's gone, it, it's pretty gone. So we our goal is to try to get it before it reached this point. <laughs> um. Neurosyphilis, ocular syphilis, and otosyphilis. This is probably the most scary thing for our Title X sites is to potentially miss this. Um, so always do a review of symptoms um, when you're a nurse or a provider in the in the uh, Title Ten site, asking if they have any headaches or eye issues or ringing in the ears or ear problems because that could um, signal that that the syphilis has gone into the uh, central nervous system. It can again, it can occur at any stage of syphilis, and then um, it can mimic, you know, like the altered behavior. It can mimic like a, a paralysis, like a uh, Bell's palsy. Um, you'll have sensory deficits, and then it can also mimic dementia. Um, in one of our nursing homes, it was found that a older gentleman had a positive um, syphilis that had never been treated, and he was in the memory unit. We are not sure if it was a cause of the syphilis not being treated or if he actually did have um, dementia. But once it gets to that point, even though he was treated, it, the, the damage to the, um, to the system is done. Always, if you have a patient that's having um, uh, these symptoms, always screen for HIV infection because, again, with any kind of immunocompromised state, um, it can invade that central nervous system um, much easier. And uh, evaluation and treatment, you must refer to a neurologist, infectious disease, or to the emergency room same day very, very quickly in order to preserve the sight and the hearing and the, uh, for the patient. Ocular syphilis. This actually happened to me. Um, what, what had happened was there was a, um, a man that came in, uh, immigrant from Haiti and he comes to the clinic and he's wearing his, uh, his glasses. So we will go through this, I think a little bit later, but ocular syphilis, if you ever have somebody that's sensitive to the light or looks like they have conjunctivitis, they have flashing lights, um, their vision is changed, then always, always test for syphilis. Um, let's see, evaluation management is, again, if you have any suspicion, go ahead and refer to an ophthalmologist or to the emergency room. Otosyphilis is... Um, uh, where it can attack the um, nerves of the ears and you get sensory neural hearing loss. It can either be one-sided or both. And it's usually a sudden onset and progresses rapidly. So it's not something that happens over years. It's, it's usually really fast. Tinnitus is also something like if you have the ringing in the ears or the vertigo um, can happen as well. And you'll want to refer um, these patients to the otolaryngologist Psychologist, <laughs> ear, nose, and throat, and um, in the emergency room. I uh, got a question in the chat. Is there a comprehensive list of syphilis symptoms by stage? Uh, yes. The 2021 um, STI uh, guidelines, um, I can, it's, I don't want to say it's a comprehensive, but it's most of the time what we see. Like, again, as soon as you think you've got all these symptoms down, somebody's going to present with something that's going to uh, surprise you. Oh, thank you, Heather. Yeah, I'll look at including some stuff in the chat as we continue. Yeah, thank you. Um, so any questions about the different stages? No? All right. Well, now we're going to get into diagnostic methods. How, okay, so we have something in front of us that might look like something. How do we figure out if it's actually syphilis or not? We're going to talk about two different types of tests. One is non-treponemal and one is treponemal test. And they're a little different in the way that, um, that we test. The, um, and then we also have different screening algorithms. One is traditional screening algorithms where you start with like the RPR or VDRL um, and then it cascades down. 
And then we have non-traditional screening where you start with the um, treponema specific test and it cascades down. So we're gonna we're gonna talk about um, all of that. This is what I call my serologic alphabet soup. Um, it is uh, sometimes whenever you're working in your Title X site and a patient is referred in and they come in with this lab and it's got all of this alphabet, you have no idea what that test is because it's not one that you may use in your clinic. So this might be a handy um, uh, tool for you to see if that test is a non-treponemal test or whether it is a treponemal test. And we're going to go through the differences in the two here in just a second. Ah, my slide moved again. Um, so with non-treponemal tests, I want to I want to give you an analogy before we go too much further. So I did OB um care for about 10 years and so much of what I think of with the treponemal test and the non-treponemal matches up with the types of pregnancy tests that we have available to us. You know there's a pregnancy test that you can do in the clinic that says it's got a line and if it's got a line you're pregnant and if it doesn't have a line you're not. That's a yes or no answer. Um, that is going to be your treponemal. That's going to be your yes you have or no you don't. Then there is the RPR and the VDRL, which is a lot like your HCG quantitative, where if you send it off to the lab, it can give you a number um, that usually associates with the number of weeks pregnant that that patient is. It doesn't tell you anything just mainly on that on that first level, but then when you repeat it again, you can see if that level has gone up or down, and that helps to know how that pregnancy is doing. All right, now, so put pregnancy aside, that is what we're talking about with the VDRL and RPR. It is a test that is not treponemal specific, so therefore you can have more um, uh, things that cause you to get a false positive such as immuno, uh, immune disease like um, lupus, IV drug use, recent fevers or um, pregnancy. Pregnancy can give you a, a false positive. Um, you can also get false positives if you've had like a recent vaccine. Um, so just because you get a positive VDRL or RPR does not mean that they have syphilis. That means we need to do further testing. Um, so at that point, you would do the specific treponemal test. Now, the advantages is the advantage to doing the treponemal um, serologic test is that it's cheap and it's easy, and it also allows for quantifiable results whenever we are watching the titers for treatment. So it is used. It's just you can't make a determination if they have syphilis or not. Um, based on just that one test. Oh, here's a list of all of the other uh, things that can cause a biologic false positive. Um, and uh, an example of this would be if your uh, lab comes back and uh, it would be, actually, it wouldn't be this. It would be the VDRL would be reactive and the um, CIA would be non-reactive that would be a false positive. So here is a list of all of the different types of treponemal specific tests. I think that you use the CIA in most of your clinics, but you might also use the um, rapid test. I believe you use the ChemBio HIV syphilis combo test, and that is a treponemal specific test you're actually testing for the specific antibodies of um, uh, against the antigens associated with treponemal pallidum. So um, it's qualitative. So it doesn't give you any titer to, to, to say how prominent that load is in the bloodstream. It's just the yes or no question. Um, once you have syphilis and you have those antibodies, it's usually positive for life. In 95% of all cases, that antibody will stay positive. So you can't just do this test and, and know that, oh, they have syphilis and they need treatment. Not necessarily, because if they've uh, had syphilis, they've had treatment, it's still going to stay positive 
this one is still going to stay positive. That's when you have to look at your titers to see if it's new or if it's an old infection. Um, the advantages is this of using this one as your primary uh, test is that it's sensitive and specific. You can detect more cases um, and uh, it's traditionally used as the confirmatory, but you can also turn that around and use it for screening and then reflex your RPR uh, for your for your titer. Um, one of the analogies I like to work in here is um with the with the the titer staying positive for life is if you can imagine a fish bowl you know all kids i think have to have a goldfish at one at one time or another so you've got the goldfish in the fish bowl and um it's swimming around and then um uh you pour bleach in that water what happens to that goldfish Look, it's going to die. Okay, but is the DNA of that fish still in that water? Yes, it's still there because we hadn't dipped it out. Um, that is the same way that syphilis um, antibodies are. Once you once you get that um, that syphilis in there, then the antibodies are present. And even if you pour the penicillin to it, the antibodies are still going to be there, even though the active um, uh, bacteria is dead. So that is the difference in how you um, you can't just say, oh, they have syphilis because they have a reactive, you know, CIA. Now you'll never look at a fishbowl the same again. Um, uh, Chembio uh, HIV combo rapid testing is amazing. I want this for the state of Louisiana. Um, it's one finger stick and it gives you both your HIV and your syphilis test. And it's very highly sensitive for HIV and for um, the treponema pallidum antibodies. Uh, it's a two-step process done in 10 minutes. Um, it should be used, though, on patients who have never had a positive syphilis IgG in the past. And again, that's because once you are positive, it's going to stay positive. Um, with the, you can also use the DPP micro reader for objective results because, you know, all of our eyes see things differently. So that makes it more objective and it is re reimbursable. Some, for some of you who just have the syphilis health check, this is actually what we use. Um, it's uh, it's CLIA waived. It is very similar to the other. It's just the one test and it's treponemal specific. Okay, I was um, in the chat. Um, as we go through this, I want you to tell me what your clinic does. Do you do traditional screening for syphilis or do you do non-traditional screening? What do you key in first? Do you key in the RPR or VDRL or do you key in the EIA or CIA? Which one? Traditional is RPR, VDRL and non-traditional is the EIA or CIA. Here's what we usually have coming into our Title X um, clinics is they may go to the blood bank and try to donate blood. Well, the blood banks down here, not sure about in Montana, but the ones down here are still doing the RPR for syphilis test on the donated blood or plasma. So um, as we know, there can be false positives with that. So a patient gets all freaked out whenever they, they call them and say they've got syphilis and they come to the health unit and they say, oh, we were, we were told we had syphilis and that's, that's, I, I'm going to, going to get a divorce. Well, um, it's up to us to really then calm them down and explain that that can give a false positive. What I'm going to do is I'm going to do um, the confirmation test and then let's see what, what comes up. Um, so that is, that is typically what we have to do. Oh, we already did this poll. So sorry. All right. This is, um, once you understand the, the way that the syphilis IgG goes up, you see this green line, it goes up and then it stays up um, in 95% of all cases, it will stay positive. Now with the VDRL, I want you to look at 
the it's actually this imaginary line here. You can see this VDRL going up the 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 yellow and it goes up and then eventually it will come down to most of the time it'll come down to non-reactive when they've been treated but sometimes it can even come down to non-reactive when they have not been treated so uh, the the statistic is in about 45 percent of all patients um, who have not been treated if you're just screening with the vdrl 45 percent of the the patients are going to go back to non-reactive not ever having been treated so that's why we recommend that we screen with this, the IgG, because you're going to catch all the people that have that have ever had syphilis that have been treated and the ones that haven't been treated. And then you do the research to make sure that they've been treated and that they haven't had a fourfold increase. So um, that is that is the way we really do recommend doing it, um, if at all possible. So again, the reverse screening is where you're looking at the specific antibodies with the CIA. It's automated, it's fast, um, it's done on a machine. Uh, less lab-to-lab -lab variation. There's also less, less eye variation, so that's that's a good thing. But the disadvantages and the reason why we still have the RPR and VDRL is because it can't be used to monitor treatment. When you treat and you have that titer, you need to document a fourfold decrease to make sure that your, your treatment was adequate. All right, uh, let's see, I think I said all that. It takes two. Well, it, it takes two to get syphilis. It also takes two to diagnose, two tests that is. Um, you're going to need the treponema specific, and then you're going to need either the VDRL, RPR, to be reactive. If you get one that's saying yes and another one that's saying no, that's when a tiebreaker comes in, usually a TPPA, to either say for sure it's yes or for sure it's no. Um, and this is the way we distinguish between uh, active and inactive syphilis. You can also um, look at your uh, titers. You got to follow those titers and then see if it's been a fourfold increase that may, may indicate a patient has been reinfected. The following of the titers is done um, at six and 12 months if it's primary and secondary, and then early and late has six, 12, and 24 months. If they're HIV infected because they have a higher risk of developing neurosyphilis, we watch them a little more closely with repeat titers, six, 12, three, six, 12, 18, and 24 months. Um, I like this because sometimes you get this patient that comes into your clinic and they look like they have a primary shanker. And I mean, it just looks as classic as it can be. And you get that, uh, that, um, that lab back and it's negative. And you're like, well, how can that be? It takes time. There's a window period between the time that you um, get infected and may have symptoms before that the antibodies are created. So it may be that in with the VDRL and RPR, 60 to 80% of all cases will be positive if they have a lesion. For the CIA, 65 to 90% will be positive. But in on the opposite of that, you see how, um, you know, 10 to, what is that, 35% may be negative but they still had the primary and you still treated them with the bicillin and they're good. So the reason why we, we talk about this slide is because sometimes if it looks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, it is a duck regardless of what the lab says. Um, now with secondary, because it is a, a rapid dissemination into the entire body and you have more global symptoms, by then if that rash is there and their test is negative, it's not syphilis. Okay. Um, with latency, you can see um, how you can miss some some of the the 
patients that don't have symptoms because if you're just testing with the VDRL, anywhere from 10 to 60% you may miss because that test is going to be negative. Whereas only 5% you're going to miss if it's uh, with the CIA. This is a, a grid that you can uh, print out if, if you want to. It talks about the interpretation of the test results, but always remember you need two to agree. Um, if you've got a positive or equivocal um, a syphilis I, uh, CIA and then you've got a negative RPR, well, that's incongruent. So then you're going to get that tiebreaker in and it's going to whatever to agree is what it usually is. So here you got positive, you got positive, you've only got one positive here, but you've got two negatives. So it's negative. So see how that works. Whatever two you have is what you go with. All right. And this, uh, she's going to drop in the chat. Look at her. Um, because I know that this is very hard to, to, to see, but um, it's an algorithm that shows with the rapid workflow, um, all that you go through and management and labs and all of that. Truly great um, opportunity to print and laminate. This is a uh, reverse syphilis algorithm where you start off with the CIA and then depending on what it is, if it's non-reactive, then it's it's going to be good. You're you're done. Um, but you cannot rule rule out early primary syphilis. Like like again, if you have an ulcer, go ahead and treat it if it looks like syphilis because it's possible this could be still uh, non-reactive in that early stage. If it's equivocal, then they're going to repeat the CIA. If it's still equivocal, they're going to go to an RPR. And then depending on what it shows out is what it'll report. When you're looking at this, just real quick, the easy way to look at this is if it's a green test, that means it's reactive. With two greens, you have to stage and treat. With two yellows, that's a question you're going to have to complete the algorithm to find out but if it's white you're you're good to go here is your reverse screening algorithm um, where it starts with the treponemal test and the treatment that's involved with it so you've got a red that's reactive a red that's reactive with no history that's when you're going to stage and treat if you've got the reactive reactive with history, then you look at that last titer. And we're gonna get into titers in a second, but a fourfold increase in the titer is clinically significant for a, a change. So you want to stage and treat if they've had a fourfold increase because just because they've had it in the past doesn't mean that they can't get it again. Think back to the goldfish. Might have a dead goldfish in there, but if you put another live one in there, you got a live and a dead one, right? So you can get it again. Um, and the way you know is by seeing that um, fourfold increase. If you have a reactive with a non-reactive and then, um, then it comes back with a second reactive, then you've got two that agree. If you've got two that don't agree, then it's not. All right, and this is the reverse uh, screening treatment algorithm where if you have it equivocal with a non-reactive, then it, it flows on down to uh, the TPPA for your tiebreaker. In this case, it's showing you that you have one non-reactive here, one non-reactive here, so syphilis is unlikely. But if you have a possible yes here, and a possible yes here, that's when you need to do some further research and consult with your medical director or the um, STD Clinical Consultation Network. I believe yours is in Washington, if I'm not mistaken. Ours is in Denver. So yeah, they, they all have that um, awesome uh, network where you can call and run a case by them. All right, so welcome back everyone. Um, now we're going to dive into some syphilis treatment. Um, again, it depends on how you stage uh, as to how you treat. So let's go through um, the CDC guidelines for treating in the each of the stages. 
with, uh, let's talk about primary and secondary syphilis. This is when they have symptoms. So they either have the genital ulcer indicating primary syphilis, or they have the skin lesions, secondary syphilis with the, the rash, condylomalata, the patchy alopecia, all of those things. The treatment is the same. Um, it's going to be the benzathine penicillin G, which is the long acting penicillin, 2.4 million units IM. And I don't know if what, what you have in stock, but we have both 1.2 million units and we have a syringe that's 2.4 million units. So make sure you're looking at your syringe, but if it's 1.2, you're going to give them an IM injection in both sides of their, their gluteus. Um, a little hint, if they are prone to a uh, vasovagal reaction, you may want to lay them down. It is not a pleasant shot to receive. Um, so uh, just a, a warning there. We've had that happen when they get up to reg registration to check out and then they're on the floor. So anyway, um, uh, allergy to penicillin, as long as they're not pregnant, um, you can use the doxycycline 100 milligrams twice a day for 14 days. Please, please make sure that they know that they need to take all of their antibiotic. Um, we know, understand it's difficult, but um, it, it requires all of that 14 days. If they're pregnant, you're going to give the same uh, penicillin as you do to uh, when they don't have an allergy. The difference is, is if they are pregnant and allergic, you still have to give the penicillin. Well, not us. What we're going to do is we're going to refer for them to get desensitized. And usually what this happens, at least in Louisiana, is we send them to an allergist who then puts them in the ER, loads them up with corticosteroids and um, Benadryl and has the crash cart right there on hand. And then they give the penicillin anyway, but they're in an environment where they can um, manage any kind of allergic reaction. Um, here is the uh, cascade for um, the primary or secondary syphilis. When you see the ulceration, um, skin lesion, uh, if they're allergic to penicillin, then you determine if they're pregnant. If they are, that's when we have to refer for desensitization. If they are not pregnant, that's when they get the doxycycline. If they're not allergic to penicillin, then they get the 2.4 million units for one dose, just one dose. And when, um, and then uh, always want to test and treat partners. Um, for primary, it's the last three months uh, plus the duration of symptoms is the partners we want to um, test and treat. If it's secondary, it's six months plus duration of symptoms. So, um, all the partners they've had in the last this these last time frames. If you can document again that window, you can document that they've definitely had a negative within that uh, last year, or they've had a fourfold increase within that last year. Then um, we're going to treat them the same as primary and secondary. So again, it's just one dose of the penicillin G, um, 2.4 million units, or the 14 days of doxycycline. If they're pregnant, um, uh, they're going to need to get uh, the penicillin regardless, but we're going to desensitize those that are, uh, or refer for desensitization for those who are uh, allergic. All right. Here is the algorithm for early latent along with the uh, criteria of what makes an early latent case. Um, do you see all these 12 months? All hinges on one year. So documentation of a negative within of a negative test within 12 months or a fourfold increase from their last titer within 12 months. Um, this is in the CDC guidelines, but we really don't go by like a rash if that wasn't diagnosed. So, um, cause rashes can be caused from multiple different things. Um, but it is in the CDC guidelines if they did have a primary or secondary syphilis lesion that, uh, within the last 12 months, we can stage them as early. Okay. And again, just go through and determine if they're allergic, if they're pregnant, 
Um, and then the difference with this is if they have a titer that's positive, um, then we're going to uh, determine if they're HIV positive or negative, and that tells us when we need to rescreen that titer. The goal is that within a year, that titer decreases by fourfold, but sometimes it takes a full year or longer, but you, you know that your treatment was adequate when you see that fourfold decrease. If they don't have a titer, like say it's uh, your CIA is reactive and then you have non-reactive on your RPR and then your TPPA is reactive and you can't document any treatment in the past, you go ahead and treat, but there's no titer to follow. So um, uh, if there's no titer to follow, there's you don't have to bring them back. All right, this is the late latent syphilis or syphilis of unknown duration. Um, this is where you have a positive lab, but um, the either the negative, the documentation of the negative test was more than 12 months ago, or the last titer um, was more than 12 months ago. Um, so that that's what kept that's the only difference is that when when was that last titer um, or did we have a titer? If we didn't have any titers uh, at all, then it's going to be unknown duration and we're going to um, follow this algorithm for treatment. In this one, we're going to give the, pen, uh, the penicillin IEM 2.4 million units, but we're going to give it one week apart for three weeks. A minimum of seven days with a maximum of nine day window is between the injections. And what that is, is for is because the syphilis needs to, to keep a good um, 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 drug, drug load within the body to, to, to treat that um, bacteria for a, a certain length of time. So um, any longer than that nine days, the, the drug, drug, um, Bio, what is it called? Bioavailability. Gosh, I'm going back to school here. Um, anyway, it can go down to the point where it's not treating that bacteria anymore. So, so that's why we have to be pretty rigid with the dosing every three weeks. With the doxy, now this, if I think taking a week of antibiotics is hard, this is four weeks of antibiotics, twice a day. So make sure that they know that it, that is required to, to, get, uh, to get the full treatment in. If they're pregnant, they're going to have that um, three consecutive weeks. And again, not only when um, when you're pregnant, you're also treating that baby. The um, the to cross the placental um, barrier, you have to use penicillin. That way, it treats not only the mother but the fetus as well. And you've got to keep that sustained uh, level of drug in the system in order for it to to treat adequately. So minimum of seven days, maximum of nine. And then refer to, for desensitization if, um, if they are allergic to penicillin and pregnant. Here is your algorithm that you can print and laminate if you'd like. This depends on if they're allergic to penicillin as to which way we go. Um, Heather, for some reason, my, my, uh, my yes disappeared again. And I yeah. just pulled... I just pulled these slides. <laughs> but, we'll have these slides posted to our resource page and we'll make sure that they're. Yeah. Updated. Yeah. I'll, I'll make sure that these little um, things have a yes here. Um, but anyway, uh, it, it also lists the, the number of uh, days in between the doses for your convenience so that you don't have to look that back up. This is a beautiful slide that gives a synopsis of um, all of the different stages and the treatment just at one glance. So, um, well, uh, whoop, where'd it go? There you go. Um, and and also just to know that if you ever suspect any kind of neurosyphilis, which we really haven't gone through yet, please make sure that you don't give them the IM penicillin. The difference is um, in order for it to cross that blood brain barrier, you have to have that IV penicillin in order for it to uh, preserve the sight and the, the hearing and the brain. 
How many of you, raise your hand if you know we're in a bicillin shortage? Yes, unfortunately. Um, we, uh, it's looking like the last time we heard from CDC was we're looking at a bicillin shortage at least until the fall of 2024. Um, so where we can, we would like to preserve that bicillin units that you have for the pregnant patients, because that's the only thing that works with them. Um, follow, of course, follow your guidance from Montana Family Planning and your leadership. Um, but there is a website that is at the bottom of this. It's very hard to see, but you can click on it and it's hyperlinked for the uh, latest updates on the FDA drug shortages and the CDC STD drug notices. And we'll make sure that that's visible on your set. For partner notification, um, may, uh, the, the, all of the sexual partners with a person who has just been diagnosed with syphilis needs to be seen and tested, screened, and also treated as a contact. So we go ahead and give that bicillin, that one dose of bicillin to any contact within three months plus the duration of symptoms for primary, within six months for secondary, and within a year if it's early. So depending, again, depending on the, the stages, it, it, it all uh, falls to stage appropriately. So not only do you treat correctly, but also the sexual contacts and the, and the um, time frame is appropriate to you. I'm not sure if you've ever seen a, a primary syphil syphilitic chancre in the healing stage and also be developing the rash at the same time. If that's the case, then it's, it's considered primary. It's always considered the step up. So if they have the healing chancre with the rash, you're going to diagnose or not diagnose, you're going to stage that as secondary because that indicates that it has already started to disseminate through the body. All right, for um, persons exposed through sexual contact um, with a person who has primary, secondary, or early latent, so we're still talking within that one year, always clinically look at them draw their serology, and then uh, you're going to treat presumptively for early syphilis. Um, and then if the contact was more than 90 days before the diagnosis, we're going to um, get the serologic test. And um, if they're not available, then we're going to go ahead and give that one dose. If they're negative, and we already have that um, that test, then we don't have to give a dose because we know it's been over the 90 days and the window period uh, is, is already passed. So if they're positive, they're going to be positive at that point. And then um, if the serologic tests are positive, of course, you're going to stage and treat based on that, um, that patient themselves. Any questions with partner therapy with the less than 90 days versus over 90? And this goes back to where, remember the slide where I showed you that if they are a primary, you can have a, um, a symptom, but the, the, the screening test could be negative. This is where that comes in. The less than 90 days, they can have a negative test when they really do have it brewing in there. That's the, yeah, the problem. Populations with high syphilis um, infection rates, we need to notify and um, the notification and presumptive treatment of sex partners of persons with syphilis of unknown duration who have the high non-treponemal serologic test titers like over 1 to 32 um, may indicate early syphilis. Um, these partners should be managed as if the index patient and just have early syphilis. The sex partners of persons who have late latent should be evaluated clinically and serolo serologically for syphilis and based on their treatment, it's based on their own individual, individual findings. Let's talk about persons with HIV. The interpretation of the test is the same if a person is living with HIV versus if they're not. But with HIV, 
sometimes you can get some unusual serologic responses. For instance, it may take longer for the fourfold decrease to occur if a person is living with HIV. Um, you can also get some um, uh, false negative test results. Uh, you can get uh, clinical findings that look like syphilis, but yet the tests are non-reactive. We're still going to treat. If it looks like syphilis, go ahead and treat. Um, and then neurosyphilis, ocular syphilis, and otosyphilis should be considered among any person with HIV because it's so much easier to enter that uh, central nervous system with uh, that client population. And because of, of, um, of their immunocompromised state, we do want to watch their titers uh, more frequently. So we're going to screen that, rescreen their titer at three, six, nine, 12, 24 months, just to make sure it might not go down fourfold in a year, but we do want to make sure that it is coming down and not staying the same or going up. Um, Special circumstances regarding syphilis in pregnancy. As you saw with those statistics there in the very beginning of the presentation, if you have a high rate of primary and secondary syphilis in women of childbearing age, what are you going to also have? Higher rates of syphilis in pregnancy and congenital syphilis. You can see where both of those were rising at the same um, levels. This is 100% preventable. And um, it can be very devastating with um, with the pregnancy. It is recommended that we screen at the positive UPT for syphilis, the first prenatal care visit at 28 weeks and at delivery. Um, what what can happen, and I'm not sure if this happens in Montana, but in Louisiana, we, we have um, one of the worst perinatal um, mortality and morbidity rates in the nation. And we have a lot of women who um, are a lot of um, provider deserts where they can't get to a provider because it's so rural. Well, what will happen is a woman may come in for her um, initial OB visit. She may find out she has syphilis. Um, they give the first injection. But then if she doesn't complete the other two, if, if it's required, if it's late, late in syphilis, if she doesn't finish the other two and it's been beyond that nine days, she has to come in and start the series all over again. And so this just, it, it's, it's a never ending battle. And so then the patient may escape from um, from care and be lost lost in the system. They present then to um, deliver having not been fully treated with their total three um, doses given it every seven days. Um, I will tell you in the CDC guidelines, it is pretty rigid um, that uh, doses must be given every seven days for three consecutive weeks. Usually the window is given though, because that's very hard for women to get right at seven days. So a window is given to, for seven to nine days. Um, but if they are one day past that nine day, they got to restart that series. Any questions about the, the pregnancy or anything we've discussed so far? Okay. Cool. Well, titers always really, um, <clears throat> I never really understood titers. And so I, uh, un until I came into this position and I really had to dig in a little bit. Um, I want to explain how um, the, uh, the titers are done in the lab. And then you can understand, I think, more of the disease process of what's going on in the body. So, um, once uh, the lab gets a, a specimen for a titer, they spin it down to the serum and then they take a drop of the serum and they put it on, say, a card. A, it, it almost looks like a newborn screening for, uh, card, but it's got these little round wells and you put that in there and then you put some buffer solution in there and you circ you just stir it a little bit. And if it clumps together, this is the Tammy explanation, if it clumps together, that is reactive. 
If it's reactive in that well, they take a drop from that well, put it in the next well, add another drop of buffer solution to dilute it a little more, stir it around. If it clumps, it's still reactive. And they continue that process until it stops clumping. When it stops clumping, um, that is the, uh, the titer. So you can see where this is like the first well, and then they take this one to this one. And every time it is a, uh, it doubles this. So you can multiply this times four. Um, well, except for this one. One to one is a, a one to two. And then it goes, you multiply that times times two and you get uh, four. And then you get, you multiply it times two and you get eight. I'm sorry. I said four, you multiply it times two and you get the next um, titer. So the very next one, if you take one to 32, multiply times two, what are you going to get? A one to 64. Yeah, I saw somebody's lips move. Yay, Melissa, great job. Um, one to 64 is going to be your next step. And I have seen this go into the thousands. Now, um, again, I go back to my analogy with the pregnancy test. What does this mean? Well, I mean, if you've got this titer and you've got a positive, um, uh, a, a reactive uh, CIA, then, well, you know, you're dealing with syphilis. Great. But it really doesn't tell you a whole lot until you repeat that titer and compare it to the last one to see if it's going up or see if it's coming down. So that is where we're looking at the titers. We're looking for a fourfold um, change which is clinically significant. A fourfold, you can think of it like taking this number and multiplying times four, or you can just print this out and move it to decimal spaces, which is like, that's kind of the easy way. But always multiply times four or divide by four, depending on if you're wanting to go down the slide or you're wanting to go up, uh, or you're seeing if it went up by fourfold. So let's say that a patient comes in and they have a 1 to 64 and we treat them with their, their um, appropriate treatment. Let's say it's early latent. They get one dose of bicillin. They come back in in six months um, and their titer is 1 to 16. Has that been a fourfold decrease? You can look at, yeah, you can see there's, there's a twofold and there's a fourfold. You can take 64 and divide it by four, and as long as it's one to 16 or less, you've already got your fourfold decrease. You're good. Um, again, it may take a year for that to that to happen. So as long as it's not rising or staying the same, you're you you should be fine. That means our treatment is working. Monitoring the success of treatment is, again, you repeat the titers. Your goal is to have that fourfold decrease within 12 months. Remember, sometimes with um, persons with HIV, it may take longer than 12 months, but just call your um, regional medical director and, and run that case by them at that point. Evaluate for a treatment failure if the titer does not decrease fourfold in 12 months. Um, it could be that... Uh, they need to be retreated and um, or it could be that it's just taking them a little longer. Um, it could be that they've gotten reinfected. So just just run that by your your medical director as well. The response to the treatment is associated with certain criteria. So we know that earlier stages are more likely to see that decrease faster than those um, who are in the later stages. And then if the initial titer is less than one to eight, it may be it may take longer to have that fourfold decrease because just of the am amount that's in the blood. It, it, it just, I, I think it's just lovely whenever I get a, a very high titer and you repeat it in, in three or six months and it's all the way back down to one to four. Well, it, it doesn't really matter if it's one to four or one to 64. The goal is to have it decrease by fourfold. Do you see what I'm talking about? It's great. The, hey, that's a no brainer. We know that that's fourfold decrease. I don't have to do math for that one. But um, as long as it's fourfold, we're, we're sitting good. 
again, in um, in 85 to 90% of patients, um, it usually drops to a non-reactive titer after treatment. But there are, is 10 to 15% of patients that are going to continue to have a low titer no matter what. That doesn't mean they need to be retreated. It doesn't mean that they have gotten syphilis again. It means that they are considered serofast, which is where they will have a CIA that's reactive. They'll have a um, RPR or VDRL that's like one-to-one. You'll pull their last history and it's been a one-to-one. So there's not been a fourfold increase. So they do not need retreating. They're just going to kind of hover at that low titer, but that does not mean that they need to be retreated. As long as they've had that fourfold decrease and it hasn't gone up we're, uh, fourfold, we're good. This is an example of uh, six months ago, a client came in for secondary syphilis and was given bicillin 2.4 million units times one dose. So anytime I see a history, the first thing I want to know is what stage were they and what medication were they given? What I'm making sure of is that the stage and the treatment match. Sometimes people don't come back, like for late latent, they may need three shots, but they only got two, which means that they were not adequately treated a year ago, so they need to be adequately treated now. With secondary syphilis, the correct treatment is one dose of 2.4, so they were correctly treated. That's great. So then here's our lab six months ago. It's reactive with a VDRL of 256, 1 to 256. Today, six months later, we got reactive. And remember, this one's probably going to stay reactive. In 95% of all cases, it stays reactive. And then a VDRL of 1 to 8. Do we have a fourfold decrease? You can just shake your head, give me a thumbs up, thumbs down. Yep. That's right. So it was here. You can take 256 divided by four, or you can just move it down two decimal places. So as long as it's a one to 64 or lower, we are good. And so you can tell that we have a successful treatment. How do you know if it's a treatment failure versus a reinfection? Uh, this is a good question. <laughs> And this is why I like syphilis so much, because sometimes it's a puzzle that you have to put together. It's not a one and done. So you you have to look at um, the history. You have to um, look at your labs. And I want you to think reinfection. If they have no neurologic symptoms, so no headache, no eye complaints, no ear complaints, they're continuing to be sexually active, then you want to repeat the syphilis treatment because it's probably a reinfection, okay? Think treatment failure if they have any type of neurologic symptoms, which would indicate that it's in the central nervous system and, it, and the IM version of the penicillin won't work for that. So you would need to check for neurosyphilis and then give, um, make sure that they get the IV penicillin for that case. If they have not had any reported sexual behavior or, or reported sexual exposure during the last three to six months, but yet they, they're they still having the high titer, you might, might want to think about uh, treatment failure. And then also suspect treatment failure. Um, if you, anytime you suspect treatment failure, refer to a um, infectious disease or ER doc so that they can... Um, I did uh, do the lumbar puncture and test for um, syphilis in the CSF fluid. Always, always rescreen for HIV. Um, even if they were negative before, rescreen for HIV if you suspect that um, happening. For treatment failure or reinfection, again, you should see that fourfold decrease by one year. So if you don't see that fourfold decrease, that's when you're going to need to look at is it treatment failure? Is it reinfection? Or are they just taking a little longer to get down to where they need. And again, don't forget uh, the STD clinical consultation network that is at your disposal. All right. Any questions before we get into the fun stuff? This is where I'm hoping it's all going to come together. 
So let's start um, with a 20-year-old male who comes into the clinic with a rash on the bottom of his feet that began a week ago. His sexual history, his partners are women. He's had five partners in the last six months, 10 in the last 12 months, inconsistent condom use, and was told he was exposed to syphilis. On his exam, you see the rash on the bottom of the feet, palms of the hands, and the lower torso. So... Let me get you to answer. All right, so let's look at this together. With this exam, what stage is, is of syphilis are we talking about? Absolutely, 100%, y'all got it right, secondary syphilis, yay. Now, what if the exam revealed a penile ulcer 100% sec it's primary syphilis? Okay, what if it had both? the healing ulcer, and the rash, you got it, secondary syphilis. Perfect. Very good. Uh, let's go on to case study number two. 35-year-old uh, female comes in for her annual exam, and she gets a refill on her depo, Provera, for her contraceptive method. She's asymptomatic, and I'm going to give you a hint. When I say asymptomatic, what does that rule out? primary and secondary. You can't have primary and secondary and be asymptomatic. Okay, so I gave you a hint. Um, PAP was done, STI testing, and then the labs return and you've got um, negative, negative, but then on syphilis, you've got reactive, non-reactive, reactive. I want to show you how my brain works. What happens is I look at the lab results when you've got two, this one and this one agree, you know you're dealing with syphilis in some form or fashion. So you know it's not a biologic false positive. So we're dealing with syphilis. Now we have to figure out, is it new syphilis or is it old treated syphilis? Okay, so now let's uh, launch this poll. There's four questions on this one. Based on the labs and the exam history, what is your next steps? Well, you have to know, uh, because you know it's syphilis in some form or fashion, but you don't know if they were ever treated in the past, you really need to contact your health department or your disease, uh, disease intervention specialist, if you call them that, um, for a record search. And so what they're going to do is they're going to pull any records like the past history, the treatment, your past labs, and just make sure that um, that they were treated, they were staged and treated in the past and um, and that they haven't had a fourfold increase in their titer, which we know we ha they haven't because it is non-reactive. Um, so the DIS comes back and says, okay, they had a negative six months ago. We're within that one year window. We know it's early latent. We know they're going to get one dose of the bicillin. But if they come back and they say that the last lab was 13 months ago, you can see where that goes from that one year period to the to the more than one year. And then you're going to stage as late latent. And that changes the treatment from one dose to now three doses. The next one. This is the guy who uh, came to see me. Um, the, he is the 32-year-old uh, from Haiti. He was referred for a positive syphilis test. He had his eyeglasses on, and when I asked him to remove them, he had right eye pain, decreased vision, and photophobia. And actually, one um, pupil was non-reactive, and he had iritis. What are we going to do?
we're definitely going to draw the lab just so we have it in our system. Dim the lights for comfort. We don't want him to suffer. Um, but giving the bicell an IM is the incorrect move because he could think, oh, good, I'm treated. I'm good to go when he could actually lose his sight because the IM is not going to work for neurosyphilis when the eye is involved. Um, so, and yes, you would call your medical director or send him to the ER immediately. Very good. Um, yes. And so the end of the story was we sent him to the ER. He had a lumbar puncture by the infectious disease specialist. He did have a uh, VDRL in his um, CSF fluid of one to eight. He was treated with IV penicillin and retained his vision. Yay, success story. All right, um, case study four is a, a female that comes in with a positive UPT in the clinic. She was treated for secondary syphilis two years ago with bicillin times one. All right, right there. Is that the appropriate treatment for secondary syphilis? One dose of 2.4. Yes, very good. So we're good there. Keep going. Labs two years ago were reactive and one to 32. So she comes in today and she's got reactive, non-reactive, reactive. All right. The first thing, look at these labs. Are we dealing with syphilis in some form or fashion? Do we have two that agree? So yes. Now, is it active or is it dead? Look at your past labs. We've got a 1 to 32 and now we have non-reactive. Is this a fourfold decrease? Yes. Does this person need retreated? No. Are y'all getting that? Y'all seeing? Give me a thumbs up if y'all are good. Okay. Awesome. I saw it. All right. We're going to skip forward. I know we're running out of time. I want to make sure you have plenty of time for questions. Case study five is a female comes in for STI testing, has a new sexual partner with inconsistent condom use. Um, exam was normal. So exam normal, I just said that it can't be two stages, right? Um, labs return and it's reactive, non-reactive, reactive. Are we dealing with syphilis in some form or fashion? Yes. Okay. Is it live or dead? How do we know? We got to consult DIS or our state health department, right? And they're going to give us all the answers to this puzzle that we need. <laughs> Either they're going to have something or they're not going to have something. So when it comes back, all right. Yes, this is syphilis in some, some form of fashion. And then if there's no past history, we're dealing with a syphilis, SUD, syphilis of unknown duration, in which they're going to get the full three doses one week apart. Perfect. Excellent job. Case study six is a 32-year-old MSM presents to clinic with a painless penile ulcer. We gave him 2.4 million units IM the same day, and then his labs return in a few days showing reactive and 1 to 32. All right. Yes, it's syphilis, and you're going to give that one dose, which was already given in clinic. The only follow-up would be um, that you need to call him and make sure that he knows to to uh, that all of his partners in the last three months need to come in for screening and um, contact um, protocol. And the other thing is, let's say he's HIV negative. When are we going to see him back? Uh, 
Um, a 49 year old comes in with tinea uh, versus psoriasis and then also has vitiligo of the glands, but no sores, no rashes, no other symptoms. Um, then uh, reactive, non-reactive, reactive on his labs. The DIS history, he said he's been treated for primary syphilis in 2000 um, with bicillin times one dose. Is this the correct treatment for primary syphilis? Yes, the one dose. That's good. All right, now look at this titer, one to 16. Divide 16 by four. Did he have a fourfold decrease in his titer? Does he need retreat it? Yes or no? You are right. Excellent. Very good. Um, are, is it kind of starting to get to get, come together a little bit? Okay. It's a puzzle. I know. Um, 28 year old comes in and has reactive, negative, reactive. So is this syphilis in some form or fashion? Yes. All right, we get the DIS report and it says he was treated for late latent in 2001 with bicillin times three, which is the correct uh, dose for our, our treatment for late latent. And his last titer is one to eight. Did this go down fourfold? Does he need retreated? No. Good. Um. All right, here's common. A uh, 42-year-old comes to the clinic and has the annual exam. Her labs come back reactive, negative, reactive. Is this syphilis or a biologic false positive? Syphilis, yes, in some form or fashion. Then we get the DI's report and there's nothing. So what stage is this going to be? I'm trying to read lips. <laughs> Syphilis of unknown duration, right? Because we don't, we can't, we can't say it was within a year. We can't say it was, I mean, no, no history at all means it's unknown duration. So anyway, we're going to give him three doses one week apart or her. Okay. 24 year old uh, comes to clinic with a rash on the abdomen and the hands. The testing was done and was go ahead. We went ahead and um, gave her the bicillin 2.4 times one dose that same day. Her labs come back. Was it syphilis? Was syphilis what was causing that rash? Yes. Um, set, and this is primary or secondary syphilis? Secondary syphilis. And was this the correct treatment that was already given? Do we need any more doses? Nope. So you're good. You've already treated. And so if this is a person with HIV, a person living with HIV, then um, when are we going to bring them back to repeat this titer? That's correct. Three months. Very good. All right. Uh, here's a... Uh, a 35-year-old with a penile ulcer for two weeks, treated for primary syphilis the same day. Labs come back reactive, 1 to 64. Uh, almost the same thing, just a different stage. What stage is this? Primary. Correct treatment. There's our labs. It was definitely syphilis. Now, even if this was non-reactive, if you see that penile ulcer, you can still have an early syphilis and it just not be showing up yet. So don't think that your eyes misfooled you. It may just be that the lab hasn't caught up to what your eyes saw. Okay, fourfold decrease. Let's say this person is a person um, without HIV. You're going to repeat it in six months. It should be a fourfold decrease. What is a fourfold decrease? Divide this by four and tell me what it is. Yes, one to 16. So as long as it's a one to 16 or less, we are good. Here is a, uh, I think we just got a couple more of these if I'm not mistaken. Um, 
20 year old comes in for a refill on her birth control. We do re routine screening and she has a reactive, non-reactive, reactive. And then we call in our DIS and no history of syphilis. What stage is this? SUD, syphilis of unknown duration, because if we don't have any labs at all to base it on, we know it's syphilis here because we've got two saying yes, but we don't have history. So we're going to stage as syphilis of unknown duration. And how many shots do they get? One or three? Three. Excellent. Excellent. Three shots, one week apart. STI screening due to this new sexual partner. Equivocal, non-reactive, reactive. Now, I don't know if I made this plain, but any equivocal, we go ahead and treat like it is a reactive because it could be just an early. So let's say that that's reactive, non-reactive, reactive. Are we dealing with syphilis? Yes. Yeah. And then no history. So it's going to be staged as syphilis of unknown duration and how many shots one or three three you got it annual exam uh we did the screening and it comes back reactive one to 64 and then we have the dis that comes back no symptoms that we saw on exam but it might be a a, a um a, a shanker hiding up near the cervix if we didn't see it, we didn't see it, right? Um, so DIS report comes back and says that the um, the last syphilis test was negative four months ago. So what stage are we in? Early. Very good. And do we get one shot of penicillin or three? Yes. Great job. I think this is the last one. Um, we've got a 25-year-old who comes in. She's seen by the nurse practitioner and treated for trichomoniasis the same day. Her labs come back and it's reactive, non-reactive, non-reactive. What's this? No syphilis, right? It can happen. It can happen. Um, the way I remember that two must agree is if you've ever had a two-year-old that didn't get their way and they go to mama and and she says no I don't think so and then she then he goes to dad and dad says yes then who gets the determining vote grandma right this is the way I think about it reactive so one parent saying yes the other parent saying no grandma's gonna have the tiebreaker okay so whatever grandma says is what, she, what gets done. <laughs> All right. Oh, let's see. There's uh, one more. One more. So routine screening, equivocal, non-reactive, reactive. Remember anything with equivocal, we're going to just replace that in our brain with reactive. It's better to err with, uh, with the rates we have in syphilis. It's better to err on the safe side and go ahead and treat versus not. So you've got two that's saying yes, then you're going to go ahead and stage and treat. No history is syphilis fund known duration and one or three. Yes, I think you've got it three injections one week apart these are our references um and you will get the um the slides after this do you have any questions for me or anything that maybe wasn't clear you'd like to review i have a, just a curious question um when when you ask your disease intervention specialist at the health department, you know, when they start investigating this, are they able to see um, testing from other states? Does state health departments link at all? So that is a great question. I know that pr our PRISM does link with other states. I wish it linked with all states, but it doesn't. But I think that ours um, links with the bottom half of the state. I'm and I know that we're not linked with with yours because it's Midas um, and 
ours is PRISM. But the good news is that DIS uh, share information from state to state. So if you do happen to know, say that one of your patients came down to New Orleans, um, they can call our DIS and they can get that lab and treatment um, information from us um, and then use it there in their state. So they they do have contact information for others, but it might ju just not be in the same um, platform, unfortunately. Good um, question. Just to let you know, I, I do work for the state. I'm the STD nurse consultant, and we do not link with other states. But yeah, if you ever do need a history from another state, let us know, and we can request records and get that information. Good to know. Thank you, Melissa. Yeah. You deal with this all the time, don't you? <laughs> I do, yeah. <laughs> And what is the prevalence of treatment failure? Um, I will be honest with you, in my practice, I see more of reinfection than treatment failure. Um, and, and usually once we retreat and we treat that partner, then um, we'll start seeing the titers go down. Um, I can't really tell you the prevalence of treatment failure versus the other because it really depends on your, your client population. But just always know that if it's, if they say that they've not been sexually active or if they have any kind of uh, neurological symptoms, they need a further workup to make sure it's not um, neurosyphilis. Any other questions? Y'all been wonderful. Thank you for um, being so attentive and, and, um, and, and good at charades because I love having the camera on. I can see I can see your faces and read lips. So thank you for all of that. Um, I want to do one thing before we leave. Um, and I want to re-ask how comfortable are you now with syphilis staging? I am so excited, y'all. This is, this is, I'm going to say this is a win. Look, very comfortable, comfortable, and one neutral. And for anybody who is out there that is still a little uncomfortable, that just doesn't want to tell me, um, always know you have a friend that you can always call. It's called phone a friend. And that is your STD clinician network. That's your regional, um, uh, regional medical director. You can also, um, let, uh, hey, let me know. I'll 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 help you solve a puzzle. So this is something I love to do. All right. Yeah, thanks, Jim. thanks everyone for participating today. Just a friendly reminder, the link to the evaluation is in the chat. Please complete that for your certificate and especially if you're looking for nursing contact hours. Um, and then just a reminder too, as part of our clinical and training technical assistance this year to you all and including this presentation, we're also working on a toolkit. So all of the um, documents I included into the chat today will be included in that toolkit. And once it's available, we will let you all know and include that on our MFP resource page. So that is to come. So thank you all again. We've enjoyed having you. I hope you all have a lovely rest of your day. Bye everyone.